Uh, all right, let's dive in. This is always an exciting type topic because there's so much possible to do. And so it's going to be a lot of things, and some of them are going to go fairly quickly. Um, but I want to invite you through the chat, especially to make comments, ask questions, and share. And then also we'll have time as the session goes on where we specifically want you to be part of the sand sandbox, not to just um, you know observe. We want you to actually participate and contribute when possible. So let's go ahead and jump in. So the goals, we want to examine the tools that can get instructors and students engaged. Um, ultimately, it's about impacting student learning, but we want students to ideally get engaged in the process. And to do that, ideally, and the instructors are really engaged and, and kind of excited about some of these tools and what it does to make them better at what they're doing and what they're delivering. Um, we have ideas for adopting most effectively. Um, we don't have every idea covered perfectly. We won't try to cover it all. Um, your expertise can help to round out the picture on some of those things as well. And then discussion and sharing from you. Again, the sandbox analogy. I'm here with, you know, I've got a bucket and a little shovel. And um, Emily hopefully has brought a shaped bucket that we, we can create a little castle rook or something like that. And um, somebody else can bring, you know, a little etching tool where we can carve or we can make steps and somebody can bring bubbles. Bubbles are always great unless somebody has a, a bibliophobia. That's your word for the day a beauty of phobia. If you have a fear of bubbles, then we'll shut that down. So, all right, let's dive into the sandbox a little bit more. So just a little bit of a disclaimer, uh, we can't cover it all. No way should you expect to do everything that you see here today. It's just not appropriate. It's not reasonable to expect that. Um, hopefully you can pick the things that are most applicable to what you do um, or to who you're helping and then also to your discipline, to your outcomes that you're doing to uh, help students. And then you'll decide what's next and what you can add to your toolbox. Uh, we want you to be curious again and get engaged, ask questions and share. Uh, we did consider affordability, so we'll have that labeled as we go throughout. And then also I really try to pay attention to usability and accessibility in thinking about these tools to make sure they're accessible or there's an equally effective alternative. So. That'll come up from time to time as well. And we just wanna make sure that people are certainly paying attention to that. So let's talk about one that's pretty common and we're actually gonna use it in a moment here, but Padlet has had a lot of attention over the last um, 15 months or so with the pandemic. Um, people have started to figure out how they can use Padlet as a synchronous type of communication collaboration tool uh, for sharing ideas, for getting students engaged, or can you be used asynchronously as well? It can be for live collaboration and posting of things, gathering ideas, or it can be a way to create a virtual bulletin board where somebody might assemble a project or a portfolio of resources like you see here. So let's go ahead and dive into Padlet. And let's see, Molly, you're probably putting these into the chat, I'm hoping. And then I'll take us there live. Aha, okay, pardon me. Why did that? Okay. My apologies. I thought I had a direct link there. So at least you saw how that can be organized and how you can get to them manually pretty quickly. So in the Padlet, we have four columns there. And so if you could share out, let me go and put that in the chat. Now you've got the direct link here. Um, first column here. So recent discoveries you recommend and why. Um, so not just the name, but what is it good for? Just succinctly, if you could post that. Uh, recent discoveries you do not recommend, and why not? Um, what are the issues with those? Um, technologies you're curious about, and then a little place for any other thoughts, anything random that you want to put out today related to the topic, to the discussion. Okay, so curious about active learning design. Great. Ah, intrusive online test monitoring. We're not gonna cover that today. And, and part of it is, yes, um, my, my personal stance is completely against um, remote online proctoring unless absolutely necessary. Let's say for um, you know standardized tests towards certification where it really just has to be done in a certain way. Otherwise, yeah, I'm very much against that unethical, um, biased, many things, stressful. Other thoughts, accessibility, security, and privacy. Thanks for bringing up security and privacy. Yes, 
as you adopt these tools, always think about the settings in there to where you can allow just your students and also think about what you're asking them to share and then how that's visible to others or not. Inclusive pedagogy, always loving to see that happen. It should be everywhere. So embedding into any course design. And, and the tools that we're gonna talk about today are really scalable across the different modalities that you can think of, whether it be online, blended, flipped, hybrid, um, high flex, the variations of high flex that are out there. We see institutions with as many as 11 modalities coming up this fall, which is just you know crazy, but most people are in the sort of five space, four to five space as far as modalities. And most of these tools work pretty well across those, but maybe in slightly different ways. Okay, so a little bit on design thinking. See what's coming up related to that. Using exploration before explanation and teaching. Okay. Great. And I saw a like for one of our tools in the middle there related to active learning. Awesome. That was our hope there that we're this Padlet and in other ways today, maybe in chat, you can find some resources to share with each other and take away besides what we've offered. Yeah, and I see the, the comment about, um, you know, faculty needing to be aware of what the different teaching modalities are at each institution. They're doing, you know, some better jobs than others in really describing what those are. And, and I think of uh, CSU Chico who has 11 modalities and I know the director there really well. And they've actually created a very detailed table of what each of those modalities is. And for each of the modalities, they've had a faculty member who's using that modality describe it in one to two minutes. So they've done a good job to really lay that out. And then for each of those modalities, they've actually got support resources. Um, they're doing boot camps and things like that. So that's just kind of some advice there. Yeah, SUNY's MTech, I have that um, mentioned for later on today. That's a great resource that somebody mentioned. So emerging technologies resource, uh, sort of a wiki, if you will, on all the different emerging technologies that the SUNY group is putting together. And I believe it's SUNY Buffalo that hosts that site, but that it's a system-wide uh, resource. So I was gonna point to that as well later today. Feel free to grab that as a resource. Okay, um, so Padlet, hopefully folks have found that as a good tool to use for different types of live discussions, collaborations, um, you know, going through topics or again, asynchronous things or even putting up, um, you know, curated resources in some ways. So at padlet.com, you can easily go and create an account. And as you see on the slide, I'll go back to, on the top right, it's a what we would call a freemium. That's kind of a gray area, but you can get, I believe, three Padlets free at any given time. You can use three Padlets with your courses. You can keep creating new Padlets, but you would have to delete old ones. You can only have three live Padlets at any given time for the free account. Then from there, you would need to pay to go on to the unlimited. It is a reasonable, reasonable amount, but there is a cost. Okay, so that's quickly on Padlet. Uh, related to Padlet, it's something I've been curious about. I, I wonder if any of you are using uh, Google's Jamboard, and I don't necessarily mean using the whiteboard, but even just in using the Jamboard feature on Google Drive within the Google suite of tools, if you were to look under where you have Google Docs and Google Sheets and scroll down further, you would see Jamboard as an option, and you can actually have these blank slide-like templates and you can create different ways of organizing your discussion. So here's an example related to the alleged insurrection on January 6th. And so in dis discussing that event and processing it, this instructor had three columns. What did you see? How did it make you feel? What do you wonder? And students can then have their own um, post-it note tool within Jamboard where they can post comments um, or people can put up pictures. And so there are different ways where you can use that as a virtual whiteboard type space kind of like Padlet, but a little bit different. I like how it provides even more opportunities or options, I should say, but it needs a little bit more pre-work on the instructor's part to think about the background and how you would develop that layout for the type of activity that you're doing, then have students come in and use it. So it's just another step. So I'm curious if, if folks are sharing, Jamboard seems to be a value-added 
tool and small expressions. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Roberta. So I would encourage you with Jamboard and Padlet to explore whichever you prefer. Um, that is free as part of the Google suite of apps. Um, how many of you have used Answer Garden? While I just kind of wait for any responses in the chat, um, with Answer Garden, this is free, absolutely free. Uh, it takes probably about 30 seconds to create. You just go to the Answer Garden URL, which is answer, answergarden.ch. Um, that hyperlink is on the slide that you'll get later. And what you do is you just put in the prompt and you can see the prompt here. What do you think of when you hear the word makerspace? Um, and then that prompt, folks who are in your session and go to that URL for this specific answer garden can type in responses of up to 20 characters or you can allow it up to 40 characters. I usually keep it at 20 because the goal is to create a tag cloud of terms. Um, you wanna keep those very brief. And then as people put in more of those terms, the tag cloud will grow in number of terms or larger by frequency. And you'll see kind of that group think if you're wanting to do a check-in, at the beginning of a class on a particular topic, you can kind of get the pulse of the group by doing something like, like that very easily. Uh, yeah, they don't need to create an account. You just give them a URL. Thanks for pointing that out, Roberta. So that's a quick and easy one. Um, curious if any folks are using Flipgrid. We found great use with instructors and I'll give one scenario. And I I know I asked, asked a question and I'm looking for the answer in chat, even though I kept talking, I can do two things at once sometimes. Um, great, thanks Eli. Um, with Flipgrid, I have found this great for instructors who uh, want to do welcome videos because welcome videos for online courses are a great thing to do um, to kind of give that sense of humanizing your course, giving students a sense of who you are, uh, why you're passionate about the course, what you hope they'll gain from it, that type of thing. In, in doing those, standalone videos, that's great. But by doing a Flipgrid, you can do that and then pose questions to students, maybe three questions of things you want them to share, maybe two things you ask them to share and one additional they can share of their choosing. Um, so you can think about how you can do that with Flipgrid. It's free, it's easy to use, and you can just establish your video, share the URL to your students, and then have them then populate with their video introductions. Or you can do it on a topic rather than introductions. So that's another great tool that's easy to use. Okay. Another one that a lot of people have been using is Canva. And I can think of a few examples I'll give briefly on Canva. Um, what's nice about Canva is for most of the pand, well, they're still currently offering it free, I know for sure, for K through 12 instructors. I thought it was for all .edu. Um, email accounts, but I think they've maybe taken off the level of higher ed, um, but you could follow up and see on that. Um, there is a free version that should be freemium that sticker up there. My apologies, my error. Um, it is free up to a certain amount of templates. Um, if you wanted the full fledged all access to the templates and graphics and, and formats, then there'd be a little bit of a cost on that. But I would encourage you to look into the free um, edu account and contact them uh, they may waive that so you have a large number of templates and graphics that you'd be able to select from and then what you can do is you can take your content and copy and paste it uh, we have instructors who have created great humanizing syllabi for their courses um, where they still have the same content and objectives but they can do it in a visually engaging way um, for grading for example they can have it broken down into graphics and lay that out there and they can map how they're it um, learning outcomes relate to the assignments and to the grading and things like that. Um, you can have students use it for free to create um, research presentations or submissions or create even a, a gallery of their research reports. So those are some great ways to do it. I'm looking at the chat here real quick. Great, so a thumbs up on Canva and even paying for the premium. Yeah, it's nice if you can get the all access. Um, so yeah, I'm not sure if Canva has cut off higher ed or not. That was just the research that I did this week where it looked like it was K through 12 only, which, which kind of baffles me. I mean, I'm glad they're supporting K through 12, but you think it would be all EDU. Um, curious if some of you are either using or work, working with instructors to use what are called light boards. Um, you know, when I worked in the Cal State system, 
we had a great project that came out of San Diego State where they actually created the first, um, it was called the learning glass instead of the looking glass, it was called the learning glass. And that started in physics and then it evolved to um, all disciplines across that campus and not just instructors, but students using it for their presentations. And they would, e they would even have competitions and using their light board um, formats. And when this first started out, as I think of it seven, eight years ago, they actually had to have this pretty large studio to be able to do this type of experience and to make these recordings. It was pretty high tech and pretty cutting edge. Now it's gotten to the point where people actually can create these in a DIY format in a weekend for about $100. So if you have the funding and want to go for the high end and just have it all made and delivered, great, go for it. But if you want to be able to do this for a very low cost and, and get around that, then you can see these sample instructions here. It's sort of a wiki how on how to develop it. It tells you what to buy. It gives you the instructions, how to put together, has uh, pictures, has videos and things like that. And then you'll be able to have instructors then do their lectures through this glass while looking at students and diagramming and then be, being able to interact with students. I've seen it done effectively in in-person classes that are also recorded and then archived and captioned and, and indexable. I've seen it done, um, you know, just in studio settings and office settings and a lot of different ways. So it can be something that's done live in person or where you have some students in person, some students online synchronously or asynchronously. Uh, let's see, anybody else, anybody using, oh, Adobe Spark, I see coming up. That's a great one that's not on today's agenda. Thank you, we'll, we'll add that as well. And I, that, that kind of relates to the Canva discussion, I, I believe. And the instructions, yes, have been posted there. Great, thank you. So I've, I've really seen some great, um, you know, evolving of the lecture experience through something like this light board. Um, and it's been really engaging for the instructors and for the students who've gone through this. I really encourage you to check that out. And the fact that it's a hundred dollars um, kind of brings the excuses out of the picture a little bit. Uh, there was a request to talk about Zoom video breakouts. And for some people that's gonna be, oh, we've been doing that for a while, no big deal. But for others, they're still, probably getting more accustomed to Zoom and wanting to get comfortable to using some of the tools in Zoom to go more deeply and not have it just a delivery or maybe an exchange with students. Um, how can they actually get students more engaged, more active learning, more peer-to-peer -peer learning? So just the main bullets here that I'll narrate, and then we've got a great handout and a great video demonstration for you. The video is from Zoom and it's just over three minutes. It does a great job of these steps. You just have to go into your Zoom account and go to meeting settings and then the advanced tab and then make sure that checkbox is there for breakouts. Um, you'll know if it's already done by just going into your live Zoom and seeing the little breakout rooms icon with the four squares that you see at the bottom of the screen here. And thinking about how to use it, you want to think for group size and roles. And that's a pedagogical thing you want to think about is how many students per group and then how can you assign them roles so they have, they're actively participating and you can hold them accountable. And you can also have them reporting and sharing out. How might you have a Google Doc for them to access and capture things group by group? It can be one doc with the page per group, or it can be six separate docs, however you want to do that. So different strategies you can think of. Um, you can have Zoom auto create the rooms for you. So if you have 36 students, you want groups of four, you're going to tell Zoom to create nine rooms. It'll confirm the math for you. So if you know doing math on the fly isn't your strength, or you're dealing with a large number of students and a and a prime number for some reason, then it'll do the math for you. You just have to think of how many students you want for a group. Um, and you can adjust groups when it creates those auto groups and you decide, well, this group over here isn't balanced out right, or I know these two people don't work, don't work together well, you can manually swap people from room to room before you um, cast them out. Um, you can also, if you want to have ongoing groups, you can create a CSV, a, a, an Excel file or Google Sheet that has your groups made up and a name for the group, the names of the people in it, and what room number it is. And you can load that ahead of time. And that can be your ongoing group if you wanted that for let's say project work that you're gonna be doing throughout the semester. And you can use that on some days and other days you can have it be random. Um, you can float to breakout rooms to check in, that's necessary just to kind of keep people on task. 
Um, if they need you, they can request you to come to their room. And you can also broadcast a message. If you forgot to say something in the instructions and you don't want to interrupt it, everything and bring them all back, you can just broadcast a message out. And then when you want to close all rooms, you just click that button and they get a pop-up with a one minute notice and then it pulls every back to the room. And then you can decide what you want to do there as far as any share out or processing. You might be looking at what they developed. You might have them verbally share, answer questions, whatever it may be. Hopefully that's enough on Zoom breakouts. Those two resources would easily cover anything you need to know. Um, and we'll kind of keep going from there. And then we've got a oh, great webinar sharing on DIY Lightboard. Love it. Um, Simple Show is a great little tool, and you've probably seen these videos over the last 10 years um, being made by certain educators where you've got the different graphics that float in, the hand that moves them away as the person's narrating and they're demonstrating a problem um, on a particular topic. So let's say it's uh, math is the example you see on the right here, then they can actually talk about the problem, talk through the steps while showing it to you. And they use these graphics to kind of keep your attention and keep you engaged. So it's multimodal there. And also by doing the um, transcript for your narration, you've then got the transcript for the closed captions that are part of the um, Simple Show videos. These are great for doing just quick explainers that might just be a couple minutes long. And over time, you can build the number of these that you can offer for your students. You want to try and do you know, 20 of these overnight, but maybe over the course of a semester, if you made one of these per week, or you could have students do this as an assignment for them to show how to solve something. They then create a video, and then you would come up with some really good examples that you could then archive for future student use as a resource. So those are just examples there for the educational uses, let's say related to lab processes. If you wanted to get them ready for coming into a wet lab, then you can give a, a simple show video on safety or procedures, for example, and not have to take up class time. So just some examples there. It reminds me of explain everything, you know, doing that on your iPad. That's another good tool as well. Anybody using TikTok? That's not something that I've used. I'm not really a TikTok user, but I'm finding more instructors, somewhat more at the K through 12 level, but more instructors are doing um, TikTok videos to create just little bite-sized lessons. And it's getting students engaged. They, a lot of them like the format of it. Um, they connect with it. They connect with each other around it. I think there's a duet setting that you want to turn off so that nobody's uh, making fun of you. And some people use that for bullying. Um, so there is a duet feature that you can turn off so that, that it won't it enable people or allow people to do that type of things. You can have student presentations through TikTok. And there's a great little Edutopia, Edutopia article that I found recently that I linked there as well. Uh, good question, Emily, about FERPA concerns. Again, uh, you know, I have to admit, and others here, if you know, but I have to admit, I don't know the privacy settings as well with TikTok compared to other things. And this would, you know, apply to other social media things that you might take students out into and how you want to think of those parameters and FERPA. So yeah, good, good point. Um, so I, I'm making a mental note here where I want to do a Google on that myself. But if folks do have experience with that or knowledge around that, please feel free to share. And I'm just pausing for a little bit of a time check here. So we'll, I think we'll see more being used with TikTok as more people become comfor comfortable with it. And it went from you know social media and fun to now, okay, what we can do to put it in the learning space a little bit. Anybody using moat.com? This is something I came across about a month ago and I have found it really useful. And what it is, is it's a plugin for Google Chrome and it allows you to then do audio annotations or comments on this, somebody's Google Doc. So if you're reviewing somebody's paper and it's a Google Doc, you can actually put in audio comments there. Uh, maybe your school has a turn, in, turn it in license that does have that capability built into turn it in and your LMS. Perfect. But if it doesn't, this is where you could add some audio comments um, as well. And, and those do get transcribed and it will even convert languages as well. So that's, that's a possibility. But um, this is a good online, um, excuse me, extension that you can use for Google Chrome that works effectively for um, multiple Google apps. 
So for Google Docs, I have found it to be a great thing to just on the fly leave audio comments. It kind of humanizes things, personalizes things, and it takes a lot less time to speak something. Uh, research would say three times faster than typing it, depending on your typing skills. So a good tool. Has anybody come across that? Let you know. Let me know in the chat. Does that look like something that would be of use? I would certainly think so. If you're grading 30, 40 papers, you want to make sure, you know, not many people are doing the handwriting on them anymore, but this helps to kind of create that ease of workflow and actually creates a stronger connection. Ah, Loom, similar. Okay. To look into that. There's so many tools out there. Love it. Just think about things have changed in the last 20 years drastically and even 10 years. It's incredible. Uh, we have access to so much that is free or close to free. Okay, this is this is stepping into a little bit of a different category. And, and again, you can let me know if you have any experience with this and, and I'll try and uh, give you a good explanation as you kind of watch the videos just scroll by here. So we've worked with the different instructors and, and developed these using timeline. And this is actually something that's free. And this is something that's developed through uh, Night Labs. And I'll take you to their website in just a moment and show you where you can find the um, instructions and the template. It's free. You can actually develop this in a Google Sheet. And what you do in the Google Sheet essentially is you are providing the, the metadata that would tell the timeline um, technology what events, what dates, where in the timeline, uh, what, what images go with it or video embeds go with it. And then what details you want to be put on the main part of the screen, and then it knows where to put it on the timeline. So, you know, this is something where we we're looking at, um, you know, Homeland Security and some US history events. And so very applicable to that as far as historical events that have happened and any Homeland Security events that have happened along that timeline. And in the past, we had been doing some very high end productions to create these sort of animated um, instructional experiences for students and you could create timelines and you could do these types of things. But then you had this sort of locked product where you had to then go back in and it was a lot of effort to go and do that editing to either pull something out or put something in where here you could just go back into the spreadsheet, add a row, add an event and the metadata for it and then it becomes part of the timeline. You just republish it. So that's something that's really useful if you're looking at something that's on a timeline type orientation. And so this is just going straight through the website, website, excuse me, and it'll show you a lot of different examples. So that's one of the things you have tips and tri tricks. You have a video of how to use it that's only uh, two and a half minutes long. Some different media sources over here on the right that you're able to pull in. So quite a bit, and then some live examples to give you some ideas or to use with your students. And then here are the maker instructions spreadsheet, what to do with it, publishing it to the web, grabbing that URL, and there you go, and embedding it. So that can go right into your LMS. So credit to the folks at Northwestern for that and making that openly available. Um, the other link that I have on here is a great um, UMass blog that talks about use of timeline, but also a lot of, a lot of other good related tools. So I just threw that in there as well for those that do feel like digging. Let me go back. And what I'm going to do is step aside or step down for a moment and have Emily Springfield, who you heard earlier, is one of our learning designers. Um, fabulous learning designer, so much skill and expertise. And so she has volunteered to share a tool that came to mind um, when we were talking about this session for today. So Emily, I will stop share and give you control. All right, thank you. This is a new feature built into Canvas that honestly, I've been wanting as long as I've been using Canvas. And I'm gonna just show you from the student side what it looks like first, and then I'll show you how to do it. So very simply, the student annotation assignment type lets students annotate any kind of diagram. Um, you'll notice I've got two tabs here for a file upload and the student annotation. This is for accessibility reasons. 
Um, if students can't do the annotation this way, they can download it, make changes, save it, and re-upload it. If you've used the speed grader, this is going to look familiar because it's a very simple, similar interface. So, um, you know, students can use any type of editing tool. Um, maybe this is the user form bone. I'm not really sure. I'm not great with carpals. Um, but they can write text. They can. Highlight things, um, whatever, whatever type of um, document you need them to fill in, they can do that here. It's compact, it's space limited. So it's not great, for example, if you have four or five questions that you want them to answer and you want to give them free space that will kind of expand to as much space as they need, it's not awesome for that. But for this kind of thing, especially for you know any kind of science type thing, it's it's just fantastic. They can draw on here um, with all of those same tools. It's all done right in Canvas, and they just click submit assignment, and it's in. So very simple. Think of all of the workarounds that we have tried to do in the past to get a function like this. Um, here it is, already submitted. So let's go take a quick look at this page here on how to build it. It is very simple. You're going to just add a new assignment. I'm going to go into the details here. Just like other types of assignments, um, you've got your rich text. Um, <laughs> hard type under pressure. And you know you can put your links or documents or whatever they need in the instructions. Um, and then the submission type, it's one of the online submissions, and now it's the student annotation. And it reminds you that uh, you'll increase accessibility if you have these multiple submission types. So I also do a file upload as well. Now here's, this is the one tricky thing. Um, you have to include that document that they are going to annotate here. Um, there are some instructions on the web of somebody has a video of how to do this, and it, she's got an incredibly Byzantine workaround. And I don't know if that was a previous version or if she didn't know that you have to do this bit. Um, so if it's in course files, um, you can go grab it there or you can upload the file as per usual. This one, I already had put it into the files. So that document is called Carpal. And then that's it. All of your usual assignment details, you, know, you can assign it to multiple groups, you can have peer reviews, whatever you like, save and publish, and that's that's it. So let's take a look. Let me go back. I've got one that I did the student example on. And let's just take a look and see what that looks like from the faculty side. So if I go into the speed grader then, this is that test student one that they turned in with the highlights and the questions and the everything here. And then now as an instructor, I have um, all of my reply tools here. So I can respond to their annotations in any way I like. If I had a rubric, I could do that over here. I can you know, put my usual comments in including um, video comments, or if I want to attach a document that is labeled, I could attach that as the comment here, and I could give that to everybody. So that's the quick and dirty. What do you think? Great, folks, any, any comments? Has anybody been using this, or is this new to you? It was new to me. So exciting to hear that more and more of this is being in integrated. Uh, 
Good. Okay. New, new to Martha and then Eli thinking about including it in their workshop. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah, I figured it wouldn't take much. I just showed it to you. I'll go, yeah, that solves all of these problems we've been trying to do for so long. Yeah, just enough to get you to want to go play then figure out the different uses. Any ideas come to mind for other uses for those that are thinking about it already? You know, I think a lot of STEM uses, but um, you know, maybe with with some of the arts as well. Um, yeah, you know. I mean, any any visual art, mm -hmm. if you're creating and marking up, it could also potentially be used for um, writing classes because the students get to use those same annotation tools. They could mark up a sample paper and say, you know, this is redundant. That's a cliche. There needs to be a comma here, anything like that. Ha put mm -hmm. them in the role of teacher and then submit it as their work. Um, gets very authentic very quickly. Yeah, so that's at that critique and analyze level of blooms. Love it. Yeah, Roberta, right. I, I have encountered this as a Canvas tool, so I I'm sure there's something out there. Like you can have people um, leave comments on PDFs, for example. Um, but the nice thing about this is the way it's so streamlined and incorporated into the Canvas workflow. Great. And just a note on this slide, you see that sample link. That's actually just for Emily to be able to jump into her demo. You won't have access to her Canvas account to that demo that she just did. You have access to the recording, though. So feel free to come back and look at the recording if you need to at this stage. And if you we'll just go that. into your own instance of Canvas and you know, make an assignment, you'll see the tool right there. Um, I assume that this is across Canvas. I know sometimes they roll out um, like beta tools mm -hmm. early, but I have seen this in multiple places now. So it seems likely that this is just the standard offering now. Awesome. Thanks, Emily. Good. Yep. Let's transition a little bit to opening up the sandbox now. You know, again, I tried to look at what folks brought up and, and what I know that's been popular out there with many of the sessions we've done, trainings, et cetera, and wanted to cover those in a, in a skim and give people highlights and resources. And then these are some of the other things that um, registrants mentioned, and they're not all present today. So um, I just wanted to see who wanted to maybe bring these up again in the live setting. I know uh, Prezi video, for example, I'd been curious about. You know, I jumped on Prezi early on when it came out. I was excited about it, but also got tired of it pretty quickly. And also accessibility was a huge barrier. But I've been looking at Prezi video that's come out in the last, I would say, six months as far as I know. And it's a great way for recording a video, but then having your elements, um, your visuals come into the video and being able to sort of choreograph that to happen and by you having your audio and then providing um, transcripts or I should say closed captions off of the transcript then you're doing a lot of the accessibility and then also being mindful of universal design and doing narration of what's coming onto the screen you're providing that multimodal experience to, of universal design so I feel better about Prezi video than I do just about Prezi at this point so that was kind of an exciting tool that I saw come out um, Yellow Dig and Slack came up. Um, I've worked with instructors to think about how to use Slack to create a workspace for their course. And then within that workspace, they can have the different um, channels that might be related to topics or channels that might be working groups of students. Um, and then you can have you know one-on-one -on -one communications and things like that. We've worked with some folks to integrate Yellow Dig. And I believe some of the SUNY folks are using Yellow Dig, and I'm not sure if any of them are here today. Uh, let's see. Oh, great. Good to know, Roberta. So Prezi has designed a, a template. Great. Yeah, that's essential to have a template for some of those moving elements to where you could just bring in things, kind of like Canva, but this would be more live and video based. Um, what other ideas come to mind? I know WooFlash and WooClap. 
came up. Those were completely new to me. I had to jump on doing some research in the last day or so. Um, and I could see what, what people are trying to do to really push some of the social connection um, capabilities for students um, to get real-time feedback, to connect with each other. Um, I'm not sure if we have any input on those two tools. Packback was another new one to me. I really liked the idea and I saw with Packback um, the possibility for students um, interacting on questions that they may have posed, for example, and creating dialogue um, based on a question. Any comments on these or what else can you add um, that didn't already come up in the Padlet earlier? What can you think of? Maybe some of the examples we shared triggered something in you that you haven't shared yet. And we could always, if we need to, jump back to the Padlet, but I wanted to pause a moment and see what else comes up in chat. Uh, with Packback, okay, it appears there's not a base free version of that. And I also have to admit, I didn't look into how Packback is designed to integrate with the LMS or not and what that would involve. So um, I haven't done enough research to make any claim one way or the other on Packback. Since I did mention earlier as a way as a place that you could dig further if you wanted to, just wanted to acknowledge that this was shared, this MTech or Emerging Technologies um, wiki. And so you could actually go here and look at the wiki and discover. And over on the left, you can apply filters if you wanted to. So let's say your objectives are related to mm, collaboration, and as a category, let's say the collaboration, uh, let's say presentations, then it will have filtered some sample technologies for you and, and give a description and then be able to lead you to a page that'll go deeper and then a page that'll point you out to that resource um, or let's say a, a YouTube demonstration related to that resource. That's a pretty uh, you know, familiar example there, Google Slides, but maybe something like Mentimeter, which is where you're gonna be able to do a bit more um, of not just presentations, but also getting students involved in polling and different experiences for real-time engagement and feedback. So it gives you a description and says, okay, you can go to, go to menti.com and you can find out more. And there's a tutorial there as well, and it tells you the cost. So a great resource by the SUNY folks if you're interested in going to that space. And then as I mentioned earlier, that UMass blog that we had earlier on the timeline slide, that's also another good resource of tools. Let's see. Other things, somebody mentioned in registration that they were curious about gaming. Um, are folks involved in using gaming? Folks who are here today, anybody using gaming with their courses or in ways that you're instructing? Okay, Roberta says some. You know, feel free to share if you have any examples of gaming platforms that are out there that are of use. And then one thing I don't have on here is sort of more of the uh, AR VR space. I know there's a lot more going on, and I was part of a conference yesterday where there was a great session. Um, you know, related to AR, VR. Game salad, okay, good to make note. Thanks, Tammy. So if people are curious, that could be a, a resource to look at. And then I have to admit, I didn't look at MTech to see if gaming is one of the categories. Oops, backed out one too many. Gamification, okay. I'm not a fan of that term, uh, gamification. Game-based learning, I, li I like gamification. It almost tends to make it sound trivialized, like it's gaming for gaming's, gaming's sake. Um, 
but I get what they mean. So here's some info on Mentimeter. You can make some games, teams, competitions, sort of trivia type things, but it's not an immersive game-based experience like most people are probably talking about. All right, any, any other ideas? I will look at the Padlet briefly. See what we've got there. If anything else is listed on here that we haven't addressed. If we look at the active learning design tool. So you have a nice filtering system here as well. Great class size, the group sizings that you want to do, prep time, duration, learning space, a lot of filters here. So I'd have to play around myself and see what sorts of results you would get and how built out this is. Um, you know, if you're setting some of those filters on the left, do you end up getting a no results thing over and over? I haven't tested that out. If anybody has or has experience with this, please feel free to share either in chat or we have time if you wanted to go on the microphone. We've got a few minutes left. Same with any of the tools. Feel free to come on the microphone if you want to. Could even turn over sharing. I'll jump in uh, and Emily, just explain the virtual, the virtual field trips that I just posted in the chat. Yeah, um, thank you. These are locations where you, as, a, as an instructor, you basically have your students show up here and then you talk about what you see. So, for example, a geology teacher could stand in front of this rock face and talk about different geological layers and the uplift and the mm -hmm. different things that they see happening. Um, so they are, some of them have the self-guided bits um, where you can, like there are labels and you can click and see what's going on. Um, but it also has this instructor guided version where it really just gives you the location and then you take the tour from there. Love it. Thank you. Yeah, good VR example. Great. So folks, you have that in the chat as well. Uh, something that came to mind and you know, it's not a very high-end technology, but um, I'm always surprised how many people don't know about the resource. Uh, everybody's familiar with TED Talks, um, but not a lot of people are familiar with TED Ed, which actually takes some of the TED Talks and people have created lessons around those TED Talks. So they have the video, um, they may have focused in on a particular segment, or maybe it's on the whole video because they're not that long. Um, and then they've actually created um, assignments related to that. So they've got outcomes developed, they've got an assignment, uh, they've got a handout or some sort of template that students can use. So if you look at TED Ed, there's some great resources there for instructors to do on different topics from different TED Docs. Virtual hospital, great. Yeah, and one of the um, AR VR, VR talks yesterday was um, around inclusion and just how to give students more different types of experiences, um, you know, to, to raise empathy and to give them exposure to different types of things that they wouldn't necessarily experience in their own environment necessarily. Um, so that was an interesting example. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and move us down to the close here. And just to wrap up, um, you will get the slides and throughout the slide, you've got the examples embedded, which include the links and the resources that we've called out. Um, you can go through the recording as well to get anything, you know, for example, the demonstration that Emily did or anything that we did live. And then you've also got uh, the Padlet with access to some of the tools that were contributed by your peer group. So that's the end of our session for today. I appreciate you being here and your contributions and hope you find success going forward and just continually adding new tools and creating new success.